Hello, everyone, and welcome to the spring semester. My name is David. I am your SGA vice president. Um, if you're um, tuning in via Teams, if you need captions, we do have those three dots on the top right hand corner. If you're on a desktop device, please make sure that everyone is speaking clearly, slowly, and directly into the mic, just so we have a little bit more of accurate captions. If you're tuning in via Teams, please avoid any locations that are loud. Um, and of course, one speaker at the time. Today is January 26th, um, 2022, and I call this meeting to order at 5.33 p.m. or p.m. Alrighty, if we can have Secretary Schulte start with um, roll call. Uh, Senator Shiloh. Here. Senator Brown. Present. Senator McDowell. Here. Senator Allen. Present. Senator Lee. Here. Senator Banerjee is not here. Or Senator Caspianos. Here. Senator Gillis. Here. Senator Guevara. Here. Senator Johnson. Here. Senator McFarlane. Senator Mosley. Senator Bomboris. Senator M. Senator Cowell. Here. Senator Quibentoro. Here. And then Senator Schulte here. All righty, we do have quorum. Awesome. Before I do COVID reminders, um, anyone that wants food at this time, please grab food. They're going to take it away. So please, if you haven't eaten anything, this is, I'm giving you permission to get food. So, if you have not eaten anything, um, please grab, take it for dinner. If not, it will go in the trash can. And we don't we don't do that. So grab food, take it to go. Alrighty. So COVID reminders. So I am strongly recommending that everyone get vaccinated and boosted. I know I am fully vaccinated and I'm gonna soon get my my booster shot. Definitely encourage y'all to get tested if you were exposed or you have any symptoms. And of course, definitely recommend wearing face coverings to protect others. I do appreciate everyone being socially distant. Um, I know COVID cases have been interesting and everyone has a lot of concerns. So, so yeah. All right, today's agenda. We have a guest speaker. We have Dr. With. We have executive reports, approval of minutes, we have some new business today. So we have two Senate appointments, one for uh, science and one for class. We have a um, election board commissioner appointment, yay. And then we have some, um, some Senate appointments and some announcements for that, of course, announcements in adjournment. But we have Dr. With on the call. Let me have y'all see her, Dr. With. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me. Um, as you've had me all through the fall semester, I'm happy to be with you all today. I wish I could be in person with you. I'm one of the people that has tested positive for COVID, so I will not be back. I'm not able to be back on campus until Friday, um, but I'm grateful that I'm vaccinated and boosted and my symptoms are pretty darn mild, so I'm very grateful for that. I wanted to talk to you about where we are with COVID and um, our response and then because um, we've made some changes based upon the CDC guidelines. And so I want to be able to go over all that with you. Um, let me if I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully this will work, except I think I need permission, David. Or do you want to go to the Health Alerts website? Either way is fine by me. It doesn't matter.
Ah, there I go. I give okay. you powers. <laughs> ah, awesome. Power. I appreciate that. Let's see if I can live up to the power that you've given me. So on the Health Alerts website, and I don't know if I'm going to have the ability to make this bigger or not. So um, hopefully you all can see it. Um, this is the main page of the Health Alerts website that's walking through everything. And I'm going to walk through the guidelines here in a second. Um, staying safe for spring is here and uh, masks and getting vaccinated um, and getting tested are the things that um, you brought up, David, before, and we're going to continue to reiterate those. So I'm grateful that you talked about that at the beginning of the meeting. You'll see on this yellow banner up here that um, we've got the direct link for rep reporting your COVID test results. And so let me walk through the changes for you. So when you look at this COVID um, guidelines tab, um, you'll see what changes we have. CDC um, made the determination that um, for those who are vaccinated and boosted, um, that you only need to um, quarantine four or five days or, uh, excuse me, everybody quarantine or, uh, vac or, or isolate for five days. Um, if you are exposed, um, that you need only um, quarantine um, if you are, if you are asymptomatic. Um, we um, are following all of those guidelines and you'll see them outlined here. So if anybody has a confirmed positive result, regardless of their vaccination status, they need to isolate for five days. We're recommending that when they come back to campus, that they wear a mask around others for five additional days. Although not required, it's re recommended. If you're exposed, so if you're notified by someone that they are positive and that you are were likely exposed, um, there are two ways that you need to manage that. Either first, if you're vaccinated and fully vaccinated, and just that definition, you guys, of being fully vaccinated means that you've been um, vaccinated and boosted, or you've received the Pfizer or Moderna within the last two months, or the Johnson and Johnson within the last two months. Um, otherwise, they want to make we want to make sure that everybody's boosted because that's the definition that they're using for the um, for being fully vaccinated. If you're unvaccinated, um, so if you're vaccinated and you're exposed, if you don't have symptoms, you're not required to quarantine. Um, it's recommended that you wear a mask around others for 10 days. If you got the ability to test on day five, you're welcome to do that. And we believe we have enough testing on campus to make that happen. If that's something that you want to do, we would recommend the, the antigen test to do that. Um, and then if you're unvaccinated, you need to quarantine for five days. Um, if you have no symptoms or if they're resolving after five days, then you can come back to campus again, wearing a mask for five days and testing on five days uh, on day five if possible. We've got trying to help. Uh, let, so let me talk about what this means for all of you and the change in the contact tracing process. So with this change, um, there is no feasible way for the contact tracing team to keep up with um, all of the notifications. Um, in a 10 day window, we still had situations where um, students were notifying us after the fact, after the 10 day window. And so with Curative that's taking 24 to 48 hours to get the results back, we knew that it was going to be important that students be able to make the notifications themselves or employees to make the notifications from themselves because truly we may not get the information and notification um, from the person who's positive until either three to four days within that window or after that window is already closed. And so we wanted to make sure that the information was getting there as soon as possible. We also want to get to a point because we know that we're moving from pandemic to endemic here, we believe pretty soon um, that will allow us um, to put the responsibility on you all. So if you're sick, you would be contacting your instructor yourself. And so we want to start moving to that process. And so this is helping us. So when a student or an employee is positive, they would use this yellow bar to come to report their results. Um, last semester, you would have emailed it to the COVID email. Um, you can still email the COVID email. It's just adding a step within that process because they're going to respond, give you this link and tell you to click on this link to go in. I'm not going to click on this because this will give away my um, Impel ID and I don't want to do that. But as an institution, when you click on that, the same thing will show up for you and your username and your password. You click that, log in and 
a form will be on there and it will ask you to complete some uh, pieces of that information. From there, the contact tracing team will send you an email and the email will delineate all that you need to do. It will tell you how um, to quantify, have this chart telling you what you need to do if you're positive. Um, for your isolation period, it helps you figure it out. So um, I'll give you an example. I tested positive Monday, but my symptoms started Saturday. So I would go for my date of symptoms because that was before. So my date of, of was Saturday of onset of symptoms. That means I can return to campus on Friday. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible for everybody in looking at and trying to figure out when they can be back on campus. Um, we identify what the criteria is to safely return to campus. This criteria has not changed. It's been the same from the CDC guidelines. It's just, it went from 10 days to five days. So as long as your symptoms are improved, if you're asymptomatic, fine. Um, but if you were symptomatic, your symptoms need to be improving. Um, and most of that means that you need to be fever free without any type of help, without any type of medication for 24 hours. We know that some symptoms linger on um, some for a long time. So if you have the sniffles, that's all right. Um, if you can't smell or you can't taste, that's all right too. Um, that fever thing is really important. If, you're, if your symptoms are still um, what you believe to be um, progressive, um, then you need to continue your isolation until they get better. We talk about how reporting works with faculty and staff and then also with students. And so we are asking students to use that email. It says so on the email that this is your official documentation for your isolation, being able to send that to students. Um, what I'm hearing from students and from faculty across campus that that seems to be working. If you have challenges reaching out to your instructors, you certainly can ask the Dean of Students Office for help. For on-campus residents, um, this is also in the email. It um, talks about invoking their off-campus isolation plan in the same way that they did that last fall. Um, and then if they need to leave their residence hall room, clicking on this and that's how they would do it. If they don't have a plan, they need help, then the COVID response at unt.edu website and, and folks are available. Um, for all students, they are reaching out to all of our students who are positive. Everyone should be receiving an email. Um, if someone's experiencing symptoms, we're asking them not to come to campus, to go get tested, to go see a physician, to go to the health center um, if they're a student, um, and then work their way um, once they get that test on whether they're positive or not um, in moving forward. Um, we're trying to be as um, explicit with the details as we possibly can to help students. Um, but I'm going to stop right there and stop showing my screen and open it up to some questions and then I'll talk about the current update where we are with COVID cases on campus um, and all of that. All righty. Any questions? Maya, go ahead. Let me go to you. Thank you. I just had a question. So after the five days of quarantine, um, are you required to get tested before you return back to campus to make sure it's negative? No, you're not. So if you have access to it, it tells you that you can, but you certainly don't have to. Um, and if you're going to test to come back, then you want to test. You want to do an antigen test. The antigen test answers the question, am I infectious? If you go to get a PCR test, and so the difference is the antigen tests are the ones, the Binax now, that you get over at the health center. Um, the PCR tests are the ones that you would get through curative. And so the antigen test answers the question, am I infectious? Could I possibly infect somebody else? Um, and that's where that's the type of test that you would want to do if you want to do it. If your symptoms are improving, you haven't had fever, you don't have to get a test. If it makes you feel better, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, if you get a PCR test, you can test positive on a PCR test up to 90 days once you're positive. That just tells you whether or not you have it in your system, not whether or not you're infectious. So um, rely on the antigen test if you do that testing after five days and not the PCR test. Awesome. Let's do Senator Brown on the team's call. Uh, 
Um, Dr. With, I was curious um, what the university's decision to start in person as opposed to uh, virtually like some of the other universities around us like UTA. Um, so we've evaluated and looked at and I think you know we followed this as closely as we feel like we possibly can over the last couple of years and we feel like students are safer on campus so they have access to testing more so than they do outside you've got access to vaccines and you got access to boosters I think you'd see and I hope that you're seeing um, that we are encouraging mask wearing on campus much more than you see it off campus you can go to a restaurant grocery store other places and don't see a lot of it and don't see a lot of encouragement in doing so and we're going to continue to encourage mask wearing on campus our numbers have consistent consistently been lower um, than the averages that we've seen in the state as far as positivity rates um, they've been lower than what we've seen at um, our comparison schools and that still is the case um, and then when you consider the mental health factor um, many of our students have told us, have told the president, have told faculty they want to be in person. They feel better about being in person and want to be on campus. And so for all of those reasons, uh, we decided to open um, instead of being um, remote the first couple of weeks. Senator Johnson, do you have a question? So I don't know if I missed this, but let's say a someone in the student housing, the dorms, uh, one of uh, a roommate gets uh, contact with COVID or they get COVID. What does the roommate or suite mates need to do in order to stay safe? Does the uh, person who has contracted COVID go home? Was there any other steps or is it just kind of do the best you can? Everyone needs to go get tested. Everyone needs to stay quarantined. So if you saw and what I'll share my screen again and let me go down here for you to walk through it again. So for students who are on campus, we're asking students to invoke their off campus isolation plan. So if they test positive, they should be um, moving off campus just like they did in the fall semester. And then their guidelines for leaving the residence hall room. If somebody tests positive in the language of the email that they receive, it will ask them to notify anybody who may be a close contact. And so that likely would include their roommates. And so roommates, if, if they are notified by someone who's positive, will come up here and take a look at the exposure and make a determination on whether or not they need to um, quarantine or whether or not if they are fully vaccinated um, that they need to wear a mask as long as they're asymptomatic. Um, so these decisions are being made by students and by employees if they're positive, making sure they're notification, notifying those who have been they have exposed and then people making the decisions on next steps based upon that information. Thank you. Sure. Alrighty, I think there was Abigail. Go ahead. Hello. Um, hi, Dr. With, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, yes. Um, I hope you feel better with your COVID. I hope you get quick healed quickly Thank um you. i just have a question in regards to um, mental health and the university's actions in in having classes in person i've had a lot of students come to me saying that their mental health has been severely um neglected the, i could say by the university with the choice of being in in person they feel extremely uncomfortable and extremely scared to be on campus and a lot of students have um had to make hard choices in regards to continuing their education or looking after their mental well-being so i was just wondering what the university is doing to help with those students who don't feel comfortable on on campus and they're not having many options as to what to do about that and continuing their education. So we're encouraging students to speak with their faculty member. If they have issues or concerns about being on campus, they certainly can reach out to their faculty and see if their faculty are offering, the, offering them any other options. Um, if they're immunocompromised and have issues or concerns and they feel like it should, there should be a rationale for them not being in class, then they need to be registered for with ODA, our Office of Disability Access, and they certainly can reach out to um, that office and unit for assistance and for support. And know that we have our counseling center that's available, and they are seeing students both in person and virtually and working to help support. We know this is a very difficult time, and trying to serve 
and meet the needs of all 42,000 students. I promise you, faculty and staff are doing all that they can to try to make our campus as safe as possible and as accessible as possible um, for everyone. Um, for those of, that still have concerns, please reach out to your faculty. Um, but know that in, even if the institutions, um, UTA was mentioned, there are other institutions that have gone remotely just their first couple of weeks. Those campuses will be coming back and having in-person classes after the after this Omicron variant surge is complete, which we still believe will happen within the next um, couple of weeks, if not before then. Um, UT Southwestern is indicating that the infectious rate is almost near one, so that our numbers keeps going down. Um, the lagging indicators are still up, but those are lagging indicators, and so we believe that the numbers will continue to start going down. We're seeing it on the East Coast, and we have typically followed suit after that. We know that being vaccinated and boosted um, um, goes a long way in helping you to not be negatively impacted by the virus, not ending up in the hospital, um, not having severe cases. All the data points to that, the people that are in the hospital are unvaccinated. Um, and so we're just going to continue to encourage people to become vaccinated um, and know that this situation is likely going to be an endemic. It will be something like the flu that we will be living with long into the future. And so um, trying to make decisions that uh, are as safe as possible and making decisions that make the most sense for each one of us individually are things that we're going to have to do in the coming days and months. And we're going to support as much as we can each individual person in that endeavor. All righty, Sophia, go ahead. Hi, Dr. With. I hope you're doing well. I'm so sorry I to am. hear that you have COVID. Thank um, you. I just wanted to ask you about a few numbers I'm noticing. Um, so I'm assuming that the mandatory testing program is still in place and that's administering 2000 tests. Um, is it by week or by month? It's by it's every two weeks. And so you're right. We are identifying 2000 folks to test every couple of weeks. Yes. OK, and I noticed that this um, in the week of January 21st of so the first week of school, there was a total of 2547 tests that were administered. I'm assuming that 2000 was in the first round of the mandatory testing program. So I have to ask because I know this is a concern of uh, some of my fellow classmates and I saw on um, what was it, the Binax or the curative, um, that we did run out of tests and they were no longer allowing testing that day. How are we ensuring that there's enough tests for the students that are not only selected for that mandatory testing program, but for, but for the students who may feel ill or um, want to regularly get tested to ensure that they're continuing to be safe and healthy? So the um, Student Health and Wellness Center can accommodate 300 tests a day. So because keep in mind, they're doing the testing. They're also doing a vaccine clinic. They're doing boosters. And oh, by the way, they're still doing their full time jobs that they had before seeing students for other things, whether that's wellness checks, um, uh, well woman exams, whatever that may be. And so they're able to do 300 of those tests a day, Monday through Friday. Curative has the ability in their locations to do three to 500 on campus. We have not been in a situation where we haven't been able to accommodate. So the health center has not run out of tests. It's that they don't have the capacity to perform any more testing that day. And so they're referring students and or employees over to curative. We are not allowing, there have been quite a few questions from employees specifically about because it's difficult to get tests. If you tried to go to a CVS or tried to go to the grocery store and get a test, an at-home test, they're not as easy to get. And so we're making sure that they're available for our campus community. We've got employees who would love to have their family members tested on campus because they're having trouble finding tests off campus. And we're not going to open up to anybody else and, as, until we know for sure that we can continue to accommodate. We have not turned anybody away from testing who wants to be tested. Um, we may have referred them from the health center to curative, but we haven't turned somebody away from being tested. OK, right. thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Andy, go ahead. Sorry about 
Okay, so I'd like to pivot to the educational aspect for a minute. I, minute. I think a common experiment experience goes something like this. So a student who wants to succeed catches COVID. It happens. Then they try to email the professor for maybe a lecture recording or just a little support. And if the professor responds, which even that's iffy, as anyone who's been a college student knows, um, the professor just tells them that this is an in-person class and you need to figure it out. Um, and so the student then, I don't know, goes to one of their peers, if they're lucky, to ask one of their peers who doesn't have COVID to record the lecture or something like that. I think that's exp an experience a lot of students are having. Um, I know of like at least three classes that are acting that way, three class sections. And so I, I think we can all agree, well, maybe we can't, but uh, Zoom rec recordings aren't that difficult. Um, so we, we don't really understand why these things aren't happening. So my question is this, how is administration ensuring that professors are providing the necessary support to students who are quarantining? How are, they, how are they providing that value that we expect when we come to college? So in the same way that you are sick any other time, we are asking students to contact their instructors. Um, my experience thus far is that faculty have been very accommodating for students. If they're not, then by all means, students can always go to their department chair and ask if there's something else that can be done. This dean of students can would it be willing to help advocate for you, and I'm certain that the provost's office would be happy to um, to support as well. My experience thus far tells me, based upon the feedback that I'm getting from faculty and ensuring, is that they've got the ability to ha help students to make up work. Um, in some form or fashion. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to provide a Zoom call, um, but in the same way that you may have missed class in other times, that they may provide different ways for you to make up the work. I would encourage students to continue to reach out to faculty um, in, in getting that help and support. Uh, you, you talked a little bit uh, about previous sickness, but no previous sickness has required students to quarantine for five days. Depending on what section you have, whether it's a Wednesday or Tuesday class, that can be up to three class periods that you're missing because you're quarantining. And so I think it's kind of a false equivalency that this is the same as the flu because it's not, and we're not treating it that way. Um, and whether faculty can accommodate is different than whether we have been. And I think the common experience, and I think that's why we're seeing this certain student involvement is because that has not been common experience that they've been accommodated to students. I can tell you that I participated in the faculty town hall that happened right before classes began and the provost and the vice provost both walked through encouraging faculty to work with students who needed to quarantine and who needed to isolate. And so if there are specific examples or specific occurrences, I would encourage students to reach back out to the faculty. If they don't hear what they believe they would like to hear and getting the support that they're getting, they need, that they should reach out to either the department chair or their dean or the provost's office. But I know the provost's office has asked all faculty to work with students as best they can in missing class in the same way that any other time a student misses class. Yeah, so I would I would definitely encourage any students who is who are having that problem to reach out to the provost and all the other individuals that Dr. With uh, mentioned and definitely reach out to the SGA or myself personally at Michael McDowell at my.unt.edu if you're having this problem because we represent the students and we're going to try to get it sorted out um, because this is this is not the common experience that we're having. All righty, let's have Senator Quibentoro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so we're about a week in in-person classes and <clears throat> COVID's kind of wreaked havoc on the TAMS community. We've seen more students who have been sent home who are quarantining than we have uh, in the entirety of the fall semester that I'm aware of. And so my question is, or for my community at least, so my question is, what options is the university putting on the table 
uh, should this pandemic get substantially worse? So we're continuing to monitor the numbers um, in the same way that we have the entire time. Um, our numbers last Friday were sitting at 288. Um, we'll have another update this week to see where we are in positive active cases. Um, we compare ourselves to other institutions across the state and we compare our positivity rate to what's happening um, in the area. Our positivity rate has been lower than what's um, than the state average in the local area as well for both antigen tests and for PCR or what the state website says are molecular tests. So we're looking at that data. We're looking at how many students are positive in a particular residence hall and whether or not potentially we should be intervening or taking action on um, in those situations. We're looking at all of it to determine whether or not we need to make any changes to our current protocols or to our current actions. And we'll continue to do that. We have a health crisis team that meets weekly. The cabinet discusses this um, at least twice a week, sometimes even more. And I'm in daily communication um, with the health center, with our contact tracing team, as well as with the president. Keep in mind too, that our new chancellor is also a physician. And so he is involved in the, our processes as well um, and believes in the course that we are taking. It's similar to what, I mean, our, the other institutions for the, the UNT system are acting in a similar fashion as well. So there are epidemiologists and, and physicians as part of the Health Science Center, as well as our system um, administration who are also on top of um, what's happening. So we're looking at all of it and all of the data in context um, all the time. I mean, I, I don't want to say that I'm spending every minute looking at it, but it, it takes up a majority of my day as well as the majority of the day of, of many others, making sure that we are on top of every single situation, um, whether that means we're making sure that there aren't any lapsed emails in the COVID email box, for example, or that the COVID response team isn't behind to what do we have um, enough people here making sure that we can do all the testing that needs to be done? Um, are we able to accommodate everybody through curative? Um, do we have enough vaccines available? All of those types of questions are evaluated as well as what's happening um, around us. We know of no hospitalizations right now of any of our active cases, which is great news. Um, and we hope that it continues that way. Any other questions, um, Senator Lee? Hi, Dr. Witt. So my question is kind of circling back to what Grant was talking about earlier, um, but I'm asking what resources are being put out for students who are exposed to COVID through their peers when their peers are not being proactive? So for example, I know um, a lot of students in residence halls where their roommates, their suite mates are having lots of symptoms, testing positive, but they're because all of the burden is on the student to report their own symptoms, go to the professor themselves. So if if someone knows that they have a close contact, but the close contact isn't doing anything because the university is not strictly requiring, if there are any resources that we are providing to those students. If you have questions at all, you can always reach out to the COVID email address or to the COVID response um, email. And the, both of those are on the health alerts website and know that we are responding to all of them. So when I say that when we get hundreds of emails a day, we have staff that are monitoring those emails and responding to each and every one of them. And we're making sure that we are caught up and that we've got enough people on them. So if there are questions, please send people to the COVID at unt.edu email address or to the COVID response um, at unt.edu address. Um, we are looking at all of those and we'll continue to provide support um, to students in any way that we can. And if those are some of the questions we're happy to get back with students. Follow up, Mr. Speaker. So if a student has, like say their roommate has positive, can the student report them to the COVID hotline and will action be taken against them? No, or not action, but will will there steps be steps that are taken? So positive tests that they've tested on campus, we know of the positive tests and, and that that process starts. And so if are you saying I, I guess I'm not I'm unsure of your question of what action you're asking. Like I've had residents where their roommate went home, tested positive at home and then came back to the dorm and was like, ha I have COVID. And if, if, if that scenario, then they need to reach out to the COVID hotline. 
and we'll be in, in the email address and we will we will reach out to students. But I've, I've not heard any of that being reported. Okay, All thank right. You. Grant, go ahead. There we go. So, Dr. With, thank you for again answering all of our questions. And one of my constituents actually reached out and asked a question. I don't know. I'm pretty sure you might have already answered it, but I'd be remiss if I didn't at least voice their concerns. Uh, so, the question is Could UNT still reverse course and offer every course online? Or, since the semester has already started, is everything pretty much set in stone? So, a decision was made to be fully open. And um, the ability for faculty to offer a course both online and in person, um, if they are scheduled to meet in person, um, is a difficult proposition. It's not an easy thing for a faculty member just to, to provide the quality. I mean, when we went online, when the whole world went online back in the spring of 20, it was within weeks doing the best that we can. There are courses now that are made to be online. There are some courses that are scheduled to be hybrid courses that meet sometimes in person and sometimes online. The courses that are scheduled to be in person are continuing to meet in person. Um, and I don't and that is not changing. Not anything in the Omicron variant and in the numbers that we're seeing would necessitate that change. Thank you, and I have a, a follow up, Mr. Speaker. So all over uh, different posts of social media and all types of different uh, group me's, group messages, whatever, there is talk and an organization or organizing of a protest to go forth and hopefully get the UNT to go to a virtual or offer a virtual option across the board or something along the lines of that. My question is, what is the administration doing to listen to these concerns or are y'all going to address the protest itself for this Thursday? So we are responding to questions as we get them. I know the president's getting direct emails. I know I'm getting direct emails. I know that the university through various mechanisms is getting emails and we're responding to all of them. And so the question about taking everything virtual we don't have any data that supports that right now um, and could that change sure that's why we're going to continue to monitor the data but right now we don't have that um, i know i've spoken with the chair of the faculty senate for example about what it would mean for faculty to take all of their all of their in-person courses um, offering them virtually and in person and that's not possible. That's not something that faculty are able to do. They're able to offer the classes in the way, in the modality that they were intended to be, whether that's in person, online, or hybrid, not to be able to change in the middle of the semester as after the semester began. Dr. With, I might have misspoken there. I meant to have said, or I might have said a virtual option, not completely across the board virtual. Well, and that's what I'm trying to say, that it's not feasible for faculty to offer a class that was intended to be in person to offer it virtually as well. There's not the ability to offer the quality experience that um, they need for those courses. To offer an online course takes time and there's preparation. It's not something that can instantly be done and, and provide that quality for students. Um, given where we are with numbers, we believe the Omicron variant is is peaking and peaking soon um, and that all the other institutions that you're seeing that have gone remote for the first couple of weeks will be back in person um, next. Most of them next week. I think there might be just one other that might be coming back the week after that. Uh, my understanding is that they intend to be back in person as well without the option of being virtual. All righty, Senator Cowell. Um, can you hear me? Uh, it is my understanding that because the university is fully open, um, all classes are that are intended to be in person are in person. Um, and in the College of Music right now, uh, that is including a large ensemble, bands, choirs, orchestras, stuff like that, um, where students are obviously playing instruments, air is 
being spread into the room. Rooms are not being aired out in between rehearsals. And because of that, a lot of students are getting COVID. Professors are getting COVID. One of my professors is out right now because of it. Um, and in the past, there have been online wind studies courses um, that are basically obviously not the same as playing in an ensemble, but teaching those kinds of uh, strategies and, and things like that and have been effective, um, as well as uh, chamber ensembles, letting students receive their lab credit by being in small ensemble where there's uh, less risk of widespread, you know, with the virality of, of the variant right now. So I'm just wondering why the university is not letting those options be available to students because a lot of students in the College of Music right now are very worried about obviously how easy it is to get this variant of COVID and how it is still possible to experience long-term um, uh, symptoms of COVID like decreased lung capacity, loss of taste and smell, which are kind of important to being a musician here at UNT. I can't speak to the loss of lung capacity. The research that um, I'm reading and that we've talked about have everything to do with um, minor symptoms um, and no um, uh, less frequent, well, hardly any hospitalizations for those who are fully vaccinated. That's why we're continuing to encourage people to be fully vaccinated um, if they're going to be back on campus in their in-person classes. Um, and so we're going to continue to do that. If there are situations, for example, if a faculty member has COVID, um, will that class have to have a different option? Yes, they will. And there is a petition process that uh, a faculty member can take if there's a reason to take a course online um, for a, a, a short amount of time. They would follow that process through the department chair of dean approval to be able to do that in the same way that they've always been able to do that. But as far as the university going remote, um, that is not um, something that the data is telling us that we need to do. Senator Schulte. Hello, Dr. Wyth. Um, my question is, um, you said it takes time to prepare virtual options. But the fact that it's been two years since the start of COVID, like, is that not enough time to prepare and resolve issues for online learning? So I, I'm not the person to answer this question fully. What I can tell you is that it's not a flip of a switch. Um, in order to be able to offer a course virtually um, and ensure that the quality of the course is similar to what a student would experience in person does take time. Faculty teach multiple courses. They don't teach the same courses at the same time all the time, and those rotate. And so if the intention is not to teach it virtually, it's not something that um, they are able to do just at the drop of a hat. Um, I would like to get, let me get the, um, um, the provost or somebody from the provost office office to get a better response for you. I'm not the authority on that subject. But I do know in talking to the provost and talking to the chair of the faculty senate and others that it's not, if, if there is a belief that it's easy to, ought to have an in-person class and make it available virtually and that there's quality there for the students, um, that is not um, something that's reasonable for faculty to be able to do. Senator McDowell. Thank you. Um, so even if the quality won't be there, um, specifically for students who are quarantining, I think it to set up a Zoom meeting, it really is almost as easy as flipping a switch. And then you record that and you send out the link and then that's there for students who are quarantining that are required to quarantine by both the university and just common sense. Um, it, it really does seem that that easy and it would provide an accommodation that a lot of students aren't getting. Um, and to accommodate in that into something like a lecture, which is happening anyways, and you, you just record the sound or even broad just broadcast the sound at the same time 
sure, sure, the quality's not there, as if you were sitting in the lecture hall. But I think, I think I, a lot of students who are quarantining would agree with me when when I say that's better than nothing, which is what a lot of students are getting right now. I would encourage students to continue to talk to their faculty member if they're having to miss class. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, while we are dealing with a very difficult time right now, I do believe that the numbers are going to go down and that you're going to see fewer and fewer people that are impacted um, with positive cases and or with exposures. Um, this variant certainly is impacting a number of people. I am an example of that, obviously. And so um, the importance of being able to get a quality education is there, and we are committed to that as an institution. And so continue to talk to faculty if you're struggling with your ability to, to um, if you have to miss class, but not all classes are lecture and not all of them are um, available at that flip of a switch. There are many experiential courses. There are ensemble music courses, for example. There are a lot of courses that aren't easy just to flip a switch. And so while they're, um, if needed, based upon need, can a faculty member take a course virtual? Yes, they can with permission, but we don't believe as an institution that that's the right thing for us to be doing right now. Uh, Devin, go ahead. I can't hear you, Devin. I think you're muted still. My apologies. I was just saying, I think I'm see. I'm sorry, I still didn't hear you. I'm sorry, I was just saying, I, I think I need to be recognized before I can ask. Oh, I think you were. All right, is there a second? All right, Devin, go ahead. All right, um, just so I, because, um, you know, I've been in a number of meetings and, and as you know, I, I met with uh, Dr. McGuire in our COVID briefing, which was very helpful and I appreciate y'all for, you know, having those set up. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the last so, in the case that a professor believes that it's in the best interest of sports, obviously based on their experience <clears throat> and the the environment in which they're teaching their students, and of course they're going to be the ones who know best what that situation looks like. Um, and of course, you know, so um, you know, I'm sure that they can understand what would be a good line for what, what's appropriate, uh, an appropriate form of education in the classroom. Uh, and so I, I guess what I'm wondering is if a professor in their own uh, uh, opinion believed that it would be better to go to a hybrid option and are willing to do so, uh, would they be prevented from being able to implement that plan? So it's up to the department chair. I don't have the um, rationale and the reason in front of me that's not in my purview. Uh, the provost office has identified the reasons for which a, a course can be offered in that way. Um, so it would be through that process, through that already approved process. I can't delineate what those are. I don't know them off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? S Sophia, go ahead. I motion we move to the next item on our agenda. Is there a second? Senator Lee seconds. Anyone object? All right. Thank you so much, Dr. With, for joining us. We do appreciate you taking time out of your day. Happy to okay. come. And I'm assuming y'all want me to come next week too. So I will just plan on being here at these meetings as long as as long as you'll have me. All right. All righty. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Y'all too. Take care. Bye bye. All righty. Let's move on to the next item on the agenda executive reports um they were sent out to y'all do you have any questions for jt uh, i know we do have a couple things so um the only senators that completed his form were on the screen so luke grant um beige lauren andy gracie and abigail so thank y'all so much for completing that form Please contact your interns within the next two weeks. The following pairs are as follows, but go ahead, JT. You... 
Uh, I was just going to add thank you to the senators that participated in it. I really did look through it and I did try to pair up over the break the best um, intern for you in regards to what you were passionate about. So I really appreciate it. Um, it made it a lot easier this spring. Um, so yeah, just thank you to the senators that actually completed the Google form. Awesome. Just for senators to know what are the pairs, I'll make sure I do send an email out. It's going to be as follows. So Gracie and Saloni, Sarah and Sophia, Modesto and Bayes, Justin, Justin and Luke, Emma and Rachel, Alyssa and Lauren, Karen and Andy, Deborah and Leah, Daphne and Gracie, Anna and Grant, Juan and Abigail, Rose and Andy, and Emily with Alejandro. All righty. Do we have any? I know um, there was no report from Alexis. Um, Zoe's not here. Any questions for Colin? Nope. Any questions for Maya? Bella? Casey? Devin? I do have something to say um, about my report, though. All right. Go ahead, Casey. Yes, yeah, so um, at near the bottom, it does talk about the SSF proposal. Um, if anyone does have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out. I know that's a big part of what's going on, um, you know, this next two weeks and stuff. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out if they come up. All right, Sophia, go ahead. Hey, Casey, I just wanted to know where I can find a full calendar of all the events SGA is participating, putting on, um, so that the entire um, Student Government Association is aware. Yes, so a calendar, we are working to put that together. Um, I've talked with Colin, we're actually planning on doing actually a little calendar post. There's an idea that David came up with as well. Um, it's really just trying to nail down what is actually going to happen, what is able to happen in the next uh, month or so, and then uh, we can send that out probably about a week, if that's all right, just so we can make sure that um, we have official dates and times and stuff for events. Any other questions for Casey? Alrighty. Any questions for Devin or yes, Rachel, go ahead. I actually had a question for Colin. I know it, it's a little bit. We past are that. good. Yeah, yeah we I'm can sorry. move back. Yeah. Um, question for Colin. Actually, Colin, come up front. Everyone give him a round of applause. It's not that big. It's Colin's <laughs> first meeting in person. Hello. Hello. Another question? I did. Yeah. Hi. It's nice to meet you in person. You too. Um, my question was just on your exec report. You said talked about finalizing the details for the next event, something called Lucky Charm. So I was just wondering if you wanted to expand on that a little bit more. Sure. I should think that was Maya's event. Sorry. Um, that was something <gasps> they were going to do for um, National Squirrel Day that never came about. But, but it is going Maya. to. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, it is going to still be a thing because I just wanted to start like new SGA traditions of doing like fun events. So it's going to be Lucky Charms, um, basically a bracelet making event with Lucky mascot. Um, I'll have like a bunch of SGA, Eagle Charms, Squirrel Charms. Um, I believe the tentative date is February 17th. Um, but like I said, we're going to get all the dates solidified within next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Colin. All righty. Yeah. This is the last question I'm going to take for positions that hello, we hello. Okay. passed. Y'all can email them, obviously, but go ahead. All right. So you said you wanted us to contact our interns, correct? Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, like, what exactly would you like us to contact them about? Just we say hi or, like, make plans? Like, is there any plans you want us to make with our interns specifically? Well, like I said, so the parent came, most of these parents came off of that Google form if you participated in it. I think I'm for sure you're one of the senators that did. So you'll email them. When we email you out, you'll get their emails. And then it's your responsibility to reach out to the intern and say, hey, I've been paired with you. These are some of the passion projects that I'm working on. I know that we have similar interests. When can we meet up to maybe discuss more or meet virtually, you know, with COVID or whatever to work out plans? And so the hope and goal of the pairing this semester is for you, of course, to help with legislation, but then any other projects that you're working on outside of that as well. The The point of the intern program this year, big thing that we're doing is focusing on not only just SGA, but externally as well. So if you're in an org or anything like that, 
invite them to an org. Do something different. It doesn't all have to be just internally SGA, if that makes sense. So that's what I'm hoping to get out of the pairing. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Be fun and interesting. Hey, David, I report if that's okay. Yeah, and okay. All right. So go ahead, Devin. Um, yeah, just a couple of updates. I've been very busy today, and I wasn't even... Yeah, anyways, I've been very busy. Um, I've been in a lot of meetings. Um, I was looking at having something for this meeting, but I'm still working on um, understanding holistically the uh, COVID situation. Been talking to a lot of different people, staff, professors, some department chairs, um, students, uh, and I was in a COVID briefing with UNT admin, and of course we got an opportunity to speak with Dr. With today. Um, if you do happen to have any um, uh, stories of of issues uh, that students are facing, uh, you know, there's no obligation, but please feel free to reach out. Um, it's it's something that can help me and kind of the executive branch um, develop a more clear understanding of of what students are facing. Um, and yeah, we've we've I, I, and it's not just me, Bella, Casey, a lot of us have been working very hard uh, meeting with people and, and kind of uh, doing a lot of research to make sure that we're advocating for what students are asking for in a way that is uh, going to produce the, the best results. Um, and so if you do happen to have any information that would contribute um, to that effort, I, I would love to meet with you, um, but certainly there's no obligation to do so. Uh, and then just one other small thing. Um, I had a meeting today with uh, Mo McGinnis and some other student leaders and, and campus leaders regarding Honors Day. It's an ongoing conversation, but uh, I mentioned that that was going to be in that that was in my thing. But I did actually, I did actually have that meeting, um, and, and it was a positive meeting. So I think that's all that's ha happened since I sent the officer report. But if anyone has any questions, they can. Feel free to ask. They can also email me at SGA president at UNT.edu. Any questions for Devin? No question. Oh, yes. Question. Grant. I might have missed this. I'm trying to get in touch with my uh, intern. Um, I was wondering, uh, I, I might have missed it. You said you did have a meeting with the uh, the leaders of the protests that's happening this Thursday or organizers from it. Um, I met with one. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to mention names or anything. To I, I, I'm them. not asking for names. I just my question was, uh, how do you how do you as the president of SJ feel about the protest happening? Good idea, bad idea kind of thing. My my responsibility is to make sure that the voices of the student body are always heard at the University of North Texas. Um, we go about things in a legislative process. Um, and the, uh, we had a positive conversation with pro, with the protest organizers. Um, I believe that we should be working in the uh, capacity that we were elected to do. And um, you know, the the protest organizers are are going to do are going to operate in the capacity that they believe they should operate in as well. Um, there might be one at the meeting today. I could be wrong. Um, but if that person is there, um, I just and I mentioned this in the meeting, but I wanted to reemphasize that um, you know you have you are heard, um, and you are your your concerns and your beliefs are valid, and and I think that's um, that's something that gets lost. I think that empathy plays a very important role in our interactions with students and and in our interaction with um, with impassioned students that are creating things like protests. And so uh, I, I just want to reemphasize that you, you are heard and, and you, um, you're you not alone on an island on this. You, you, you are uh, surrounded by people who are here to support you and who are here to uh, make sure that your voices are heard. Um, but I, I want to make sure that the protest organizers are operating in the way that they see fit. And uh, the SGA is, of course, going to operate in a way that we were elected to do and make sure that we're having communication with um, UNT administration. Um, but I don't want to speak on their behalf um, and um, 
I, but I do think it was a positive meeting. And um, I'm really excited to see what unfolds from this. You know, the biggest thing that we need to be pushing is policy. Um, you know, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to actually see something happen. Um, and so I've been meeting with a lot of people. I can't say who, uh, you know, I've always, my biggest thing has been privacy, not only in who I'm talking to, but, you know, there's certain things that some people don't feel comfortable, you know, talking about publicly. And so, um, you know, I have to make sure I'm, I'm a little careful about what I say in order to, to protect that privacy. But it was a good meeting and, and I respect the fact that they are setting up a protest. It's not easy. Um, and it is our job to be receptive to that and to uh, support the voices of the student body. Any other questions for Devin? Awesome. Any questions for me? Grant, go ahead. For the office hour requirement, and I know we're really down to the wire, but uh, to get our two two uh, two office hour requirements uh, for a month, are we counting January or will they start in February? We will start on the 31st. So the 31st will count for February. We're not counting January at all. So if you do it on the 31st, that will count for February. Thank you. Yes. Lauren, go ahead. Um, hello, is this working? OK, uh, so I actually did some tabling today. Will I be able to count that towards February or no? If you can send me documentation of that, then uh -huh. I can take care of that for you. Okay, I think Devin has the emails that I sent about it. If, all right, then if Devin can definitely confirm that, then you're good for one out of your two for the month. OK, thank you. Any other questions for me? I am going to release a Senate calendar so y'all are able to put the days that you decided to have office hours or tabling. Remember that you can't do. I, re, I will encourage y'all to do biweekly just so y'all can give y'all space and time. But of course, you do what you want to do on your own time. But if there's no any questions, I'm going to move on with the next item on the agenda. Awesome. All righty. We have appointments. All right. So before I begin, um, can I give you all a refresher? We did change the Senate Code of Conduct. Um, so I'm going to give you all time. Um, so we have Winston, nominee for the College of Science. Um, is there no, do we know Winston, any connections that senators want to reveal at this time regarding Winston? Go ahead, Ethan. Um, yeah, so I did just really quickly want to say, um, I do know Winston. Um, we didn't go to high school together, but we went to high schools in the same region, and he was one of those people I ran into um, at, you know, band stuff. Um, you know, I'm relatively familiar with him. Um, he is a really good person, um, but I did just want to disclose that I am aware of him. I know who he is. We talk occasionally, um, but I just wanted to make that known before we go into this. Any other disclosures of current or past affiliation or connection to this Senate appointment before we begin? Awesome. Winston, hello. You're on. To, um, he is here virtually. So Winston, like we talked about, this is the time for you to kind of tell the Senate why you feel like you will be a great advocate for the College of Science and what qualities do you bring to back that up? So the floor is all yours. OK, I got gotcha. you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Winston Ihmar Madu. I'm currently a second year within the College of Science. I major in ecology and I minor in um, legal studies and I plan on pursuing environmental law in the near future. As an ecology major, I've come to understand how important it is to maintain and preserve our environment and how it can like greatly impact its inhabitants. I'm currently a part of Bird Campus Committee, which is a group of many individuals with the common goal into making UNT as well as Denton a more bird friendly environment. I'm also a part of the Society of Ecological Restoration. I believe I would be a good candidate due to the fact that I truly do care about the well being of the students within the, within the College of Science as well as students that attend UNT. I also believe I'm a driven and outgoing student as well. 
And if given the opportunity to be part of the Senate, I would love to be part of the Mental Health Coalition Committee, the Campus and Student Safety Committee, as well as the Equity and Diversity Community, and use my platform to advocate for sustainability awareness on campus, as well as preventing sexual harassment on campus. All righty. Is there any motions on the floor? Senator Johnson. I move that we go to a period of questioning. Is there a second? All right, it's been moved and seconded by Sophia. You have the first question, Senator Johnson. So, Winston. Yes, sir. When you, if you are appointed, what is your first, you said you want to talk a whole bunch about uh, the diversity inclusion, uh, sexual harassment and all that. On day one, if you were appointed, what would be your first step? Um. My the, the thing I'd probably target the most is well, since I'm a college major, I really do care like a ton about the campus environment. So I'd love to advertise the more ecologically centered organizations on campus and bring them to the forefront because I believe I feel like they aren't talked about that as much. Thank you. Any other no questions for Winston? Um, would, can someone recognize a speaker in the back, Senator Gracie? I'd like to recognize a speaker, or I move to recognize a speaker. Senator Johnson, second. All right. But Tavar, you have the floor. Thank you. Hi, Winston. So you mentioned mental health. So I want to ask, what about mental health are you passionate about, and what kind of change would you like to make within that realm? So... I'm a student within the College of Science and classes can be tough and I understand that like my peers we all struggle with the same difficulties within this college. I believe that I believe that it is very difficult for us to find many people to understand where we're coming from when it comes down to issues we see within the college. So can you repeat your question? My apologies. Yes. Um, so what specifically about mental health are you like passionate about? And um, if you were to be in Senate, what kind of change would you like to make regarding mental health on the UNT campus? I don't believe I can answer that question fully at the moment, but I hope in the near future I can find the answers to that question possibly. Senator Van Voris. Hey Winston, so nice to meet you. I just wanted to ask about why you are interested in becoming a senator in the first place and how you came about um, wanting to be a leader in this position. Um, throughout my life, I've had many past leadership experiences. I've always been interested in helping others. Um, sorry, I've always been interested in helping others. I find enjoyment on making sure that everyone at UNT my peers, other students, the student body feel welcome within the university. Can you can you expand upon um, some of your previous leadership experience and what it's taught you and how you would apply it as a senator? Yeah, totally. Um, so I would say I I've been getting more involved with organizations on campus towards the end of freshman year this semester. But I would say my past leadership experiences would come from when I was back in high school. I was my school's African student organization leader, as well as um, leaders within my band program as well. Last question for you. Um, if you are appointed here today, is this a position that you um, see yourself continuing to stay in in the future? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Would no someone like to recognize um, the speaker in the back? Senator Allen. Senator Allen recognizes the speaker in the back. Is there a second? Sir. All right. Thank you, Senator Gillis. Go ahead. You have the floor. Awesome. Look at y'all go. All right. 
Makes the dream um, work. Hello, uh, Winston. Um, so you spoke earlier about um, increasing diversity and inclusion on the campus. So like myself, I represent um, the Muslim Student Association as its president. So we are an under, you know, one of the underrepresented groups on campus. So how would I, I would ask you, what are some actionable steps that you will be taking as a senator to help increase diversity and inclusion on the campus? I would like, when I mean diverse, when I mean diversity, I would like to see more diversity within the College of Science, per se. So I'd like, if possible, to bring different speakers from different backgrounds within um, the, 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 the science region to speak to some of the students within UNT. As my public speakings. I would like to, would, uh, give me one second. Go ahead, Senator Rachel. Then I'll get you. Hi, Winston. Um, hey, so hey. I wanted to ask, um, so SGA definitely can be time consuming. We've seen it with a lot of senators kind of trying to struggle balance their school, their other extracurriculars and SGA. So I just wonder if you have any um, plans to be proactive in how you're going to manage your time, if you think that's feasible for your schedule or what steps you'll take. I apologize, you kind of cut off at the bit of the, bit of the end. Could you repeat yourself, please? Yeah, for sure. Um, just how you think you're going to manage your time between SGA, school. I know College of Science definitely, at least to me, seems like one of the more rigorous um, sides of UNT. So how you'll balance extracurriculars and schoolwork. I, the only way I could possibly answer that question would be just by like or organizing time, setting aside time for homework and SGA, stuff like that. I don't think I could further answer that question. For sure, thank you. No problem. Would someone like to recognize the speaker in the back? Senator Allen. Senator Allen uh, acknowledges the speaker in the back. Is there a second? Senator Lee seconds. Awesome. Go ahead, you have the floor. Sorry. Hi, uh, Winston. You uh, mentioned how you were passionate in joining, uh, you know, the Committee for Harassment, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, wait. Repeat yourself. My, my apologies. You did. You said uh, that you were, uh, if you were appointed senator, that something that you wanted to, uh, you were passionate about was also, I believe it was the harassment. Yeah, sexual harassment on campus. Yes. Awesome. As a woman, um, you know, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of um, I guess what I'm trying to ask here is the question that I, I have had to ask is uh, how would you as a senator, what would you do to be able to, you know, alleviate some of, of that the issues that we have on campus regarding sexual harassment? Um, from my own experience as like freshman year coming into uh, like freshman orientation, I personally didn't have to do any mandatory work or watch any mandatory videos regarding this issue. So I'd love to uh, like see if that can be implemented for up for incoming freshmen through fre freshman orientation. Okay, thank you. Senator Givara. Hello. Oh. Hello. Um, so I have a quick question. Um, with SGA, we work a lot with other departments on campus, like um, UPC, the Black Student Union, the Pride Alliance. So do you see yourself um, reaching out to these um, organizations um, for like any collaborations? I mean, it wasn't a direct thought, but I'm totally capable. Okay, yeah, thank you. Would someone like to recognize JT? Senator Cal. I recognize JT. Is there a second? Senator Allen seconds. JT, you have the floor. Uh, my question to Winston is, I know that you said in high school you worked with the African student organization. I might have missed. I think that's what you said. So I'm curious to know if you have uh, worked with any um, black or minority groups or organizations on campus since you did it in high school? Have you worked with any since you've been in college? 
Not yet, not not yet, no sir. All righty, any other questions or motions? Senator Johnson. I move that we go to a closed period discussion. Is there a second? second. Senator Van Voor, second. Awesome, so Winston, at this time, the Senate has decided to move into a period of closed discussion. Um, Senator McDowell is gonna reach out to you via Teams. Um, I'm gonna ask you to leave the chat and mm. we'll reach back out to you after the Senate has made a decision. Okay, I got you. Okay. So I'm gonna wait until um, you leave the call. Gotcha. All righty, Senator Johnson, um, go ahead. You have the first discussion point. So I kind of like him in terms of being, it's, I know he doesn't, uh, he does kind of lack the sort of experience and leadership positions uh, on a more college level, but it also gives us the opportunity if he is appointed as a senator, it'd be someone with totally new, fresh influence of whatsoever and a really good outside looking in kind of thing on terms of how we operate, how we can improve as well as helping us grow in that kind of way. Senator Schulte. Is there anybody who disagrees with him or like has a problem with him. Otherwise, Senator Schulte would like to move to a period of voting. Anyone object to a period of voting? Senator Johnson I reject. objects. I reject. Yeah. All right, let's do it by a raise of hands. If you want to move to a period of voting, raise your hand at this time. Anyone that objects? You can do it as well on Teeps. Raise your hand. We do not have a two thirds threshold, so the motion fails. Any other discussion points that senators would like to make? Oh, uh, go ahead, Abigail. Um, I'm just a little bit confused as to what plans he has. It seems like he's really unsure of any specific goals that he has in mind, and that's just a little bit worrisome. Senator Schulte. I think we're being too hard on this guy. Like what it I, I'll be honest, I haven't passed any legislation as a senator yet because it took me a long time to become confident in what it means to be a senator and reaching out to people. So when we ask people like, well, what are your plans for this and this or how are you going to do this? They don't know they, they're not a senator yet. They're not aware of the access to faculty um, and, you know, other things like that that they have. So. I think we really need to keep that in mind right now. Senator Gillis. So um, as I mentioned, I, I do know Winston. Um, so of course I might sound a bit biased here, but I, I feel like it's important that I, I mention this. Um, Winston is really seeking involvement on campus. Um, and I think you make an excellent point, Gracie, that we anticipate a lot from the people coming in here. Um, and they're well intentioned. They want to accomplish things and they're committed to learn. And I really do think Winston is one of those people. Um, you know, he, he came to me one day and asked like, how do I get involved on campus? And I pointed him in a few directions and SGA was the one that he chose to go with. And he, to see someone go out of their way and to say, hey, I want to get involved here. Um, you know, how can I do that? What can I do? Like to have someone with that passion, with that drive, it, it's clear to me that Winston really wants to be part of this organization um, and to have someone like that in an organization that struggles to find people who are as passionate about the school as he appears to be. I, I really do think that's a blessing and I think we need to take advantage of this opportunity and I don't know him super well, but I know him well enough to know that he's not the kind of person to get in and to sit here for the rest of this session. I, I really do believe he has the capability to do some great things. Um, that's the last I'll say on that. Senator Cal. Uh, Senator Cal moves to a period of voting. Is there a second? Anyone object? All right. Period of voting. Senator, sorry, Secretary Schulte 
if you can start roll call. Okay, Senator Shiloh. Aye. Senator Brown. No. Senator McDowell. Aye. Senator Allen. Aye. Senator Lee. Aye. Senator Castellanos. Aye. Senator Gillis. Senator Guevara. Aye. Senator Johnson. Aye. Senator McFarland. No. Senator Von Boris. Senator M. Aye. Senator Cowell. Aye. Senator Schulte. Aye. Senator Quibentoro. Aye. I believe there um, we do have the two thirds threshold and Winston is now a new a senator for the College of Science. All righty, let's get him back on the call. OK, let's OK, where are you? Winston. Winston. Do 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 do. OK, hopefully we don't get copyrighted. You said that last session. Uh, Winston, hello, can you hear me? Houston to Winston, Houston to Winston. Can you hear me? Yes, hello, hello. can you hear uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, my apologies, sorry about that. Um, I would like to inform you that you are you were appointed. Congratulations. Thanks so much. So Winston, this means you are now officially a senator for the College of Science. That means you can now get to participate um, and vote and discussion questions for our next appointment. Anthony, get down here. All righty. Anthony Tater, he is a Senate appointment for class. Pronouns are he is him. Um, as you experienced, um, tell the Senate why you, you believe you'll be a good advocate for class and talk about a little bit about your leadership experience and what can back that up. So the floor is all yours. Hey everybody, my name is Anthony Taylor. Um, I am a junior here at, uh, well, I'm a junior, and I'm also a political science major. Um, I came, um, well, I'm a first year junior. I came into high school, well, I came from high school. Uh, I graduated high school with an associate's degree, and I came into college with 60 hours. Um, coming into college, um, it was like a, um, Culture shock because I'm from I'm from a small town in southeast Texas, uh, with the six thousand people, and coming to college with forty thousand people um, really gave me anxiety because I'm not good with talking to you know talking to people, <laughs> and so I mostly stayed in my room for like the first two weeks, but then I had to like you know come to realization that you can't stay in your room forever, Anthony. <laughs> so I decided to get involved, and so um, I decided to uh, be part of the Black Student Experience which is a program, um, a weekend retreat for black, the first year and freshman black students to help them uh, get engaged with other black students as well, get them immersed in campus culture. Um, I'm, always, I'm also um, part of Marshall Eagles, which is a um, live and learning community based in Rollins Hall. Um, it's, helped, it's here to help um, black males uh, be able to graduate college because um, the statistics show that my demographic are less likely to graduate college compared to others. Um, I'm also involved with BSU. I'm part of the PR and 3% committee. Um, I've also um, an intern for the Sydney Great Development Program. Uh, it's to help build leader leadership skills, which hopefully if I'm appointed, I can show you those leadership skills. Um, and lastly, my last involvement is um, part of the PUSH student org. I'm president of that org. Um, a little bit about PUSH. PUSH stands for Persevere Until Success Happens. 
Um, it's a program to help foster care alumni. Um, uh, foster care alumni are, well, foster care alumni and kids who've been through the foster care, well, child welfare system. Um, the program was made 10 years ago um, with the mission to uh, give kids who've been in the foster care system uh, resources and support to get through college because uh, coming to college was already a big uh, obstacle for them. And so we want to help them get to the finish line. Uh, which brings me to why I wanted to uh, be part of the SGA as a senator, because I want to help continue that fight um, as a senator. And I want to represent um, all my constituents within the College of Liberal Arts and Social Science. Thank you so much, Winston. All right, Senator Cowell, go ahead. Um, I move to a period of questioning. Is there a second? Awesome, you have the first question for Anthony. Okay, hi, very nice to meet you. Um, I, I am also in push, kind of embarrassing for me. I'm an inactive member, but uh, you sound incredibly like academically successful and motivated, super involved on campus, um, lots of uh, leadership opportunities. Um, but I, I guess the really only question I have is, do you think that you, you would be able to dedicate the time needed for a senatorship? Yes, I would. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we're playing hot potato. Um, Aliyah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make a quick statement for transparency purposes. I do know Anthony um, as the membership coordinator of the Black Student Experience. Um, so I just want to put it out there, I will not be abstaining from voting because we haven't had enough personal conversations for there to be bias included in the vote. Thank you. Any other connections or um, any senators have with, with Anthony? Thank you so much, Lee. I completely forgot. All right, going back to questions. Who has a question for Anthony? Go ahead, Sophia. Hey, Anthony, you're a fabulous public speaker. Um, I just wanted to ask if you're appointed today, do you intend to um, stay a senator long term throughout your college experience? Yes, I do. Wonderful. Thanks so much. All righty. Any other questions for Anthony or any motions? Senator Gillis, go ahead. It's been moved that we go to a period of voting. Is there a second? Senator Johnson seconds. All right. Does anyone object? Alrighty. Um, you do have to step outside um, for a little bit. Um, Senator uh, McDowell will definitely come get you to let you know the decision of the Senate. But at this time, if you mind stepping out for a little bit, um, we'll, once Anthony has left the chamber, we will start the period or roll call voting. Senator Shiloh? Aye. Senator Brown? Okay. Senator McDowell? Aye. Senator Allen? Aye. Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Castellanos? Aye. Senator Gillis? Aye. Senator Guevara? Aye. Senator Johnson? Aye. Senator McFarlane? Aye. Senator Von Boris? Aye. Senator M? Aye. Senator Cowell? Aye. Senator... Senator Winston? <laughs> aye. Senator Schulte? Aye. Senator Quibentoro? Aye. I believe we have a unanimous consent. Anthony is the senator for class. <laughs> awesome. Let's wait a little bit. Um, for um, Anthony uh, Bakhtover, if you would like to come to the front, um, that would be awesome.
do 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 Senator Anthony, congratulations. Since you were appointed, if you would like to join us up front over here, um, of course, encourage you to socially distance. Um, so before we begin, um, Devin would like to get recognized, or someone would like to recognize Devin. Um, anyone? Senator like to... Allen recognizes President or Devin. All right. Is there a second? All right. It's been seconded by Senator Cowell. Devin, you have the floor. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, with all of my uh, judicial branch appointments or my um, other than committee appointments, I suppose in this case, um, I try to give a disclosure statement. Um, personally, uh, I'm somewhat familiar with Bakhtavar. I actually participated in the election in which Bakhtavar ran as a vice president. I actually voted for their ticket. And so I um, wanted to disclose that. Um, I don't, it didn't play any role as far as my personal bias for any particular candidate in terms of the nomination. Um, I believed that Bakhtavar was the best candidate, um, but I did want to make sure that that was communicated. Um, Bakhtavar also did indicate that, um, they had a, um, that they, that they do know some people on the executive board that they're either good friends with or well, well acquainted with on the executive board. Uh, those people are Maria Lawson, Casey Jimenez, JT, Bill Armenta, and Alexis Hawkins. Um, and those are just varying levels of, of familiarity. Um, I, I, I sought counsel on this decision from a couple of those people, but um, it, I believe that their input was sincere. Um, and uh, it's going to be the Senate's at the Senate's discretion how heavily that needs to weigh in the decision. Um, but I do believe this was an excellent candidate for the position. And I look forward to hearing uh, Bob Tauver uh, state their case to the Senate. Thank you. Awesome. Before we continue, I will, I'm going to pull up um, the election code um, just for our new senators that have joined us. I know that I have sent an email out with the responsibilities, but just in case we need a refresher on what the election board commissioner does, you can find it on our website, on our homepage, scrolling down to section five or it's been a hot minute since I've reviewed this. All right. Right here. So um, you can find this section five of article. I'm not going to scroll up, but essentially the election board commissioner does uh, chair the election board and supervises all election personnel and uphold the election code by executing all decisions of the election board. They have to remain impartial to any candidates or referendum parties participating in the election. They also have to execute provisions of the um, the SJ Constitution related to election and all provisions of the election code. They are the liaison between the election board and other entities on campus representing the election board in any public situation. Of course, the election board commissioner um, plans election board sponsor events, maintains contact with electoral candidates, and coordinates the responsibilities that may arise as directed by the SGA president. Um, of course, they have the authority to expend funds appropriated to the board with their approval by a simple majority. Um, they also have to draft the final election report. Um, there is the, you can read that. Unofficial results should not be released. Okay, that is not. Also have um, the election board commissioner has the right to solicit names of all members of a campaign from the affiliate candidate or referendum party. So again, you can, this is on the website. Um, sorry to take a little bit of your thunder, but let's go ahead. Um, 
tell us why um, Bakhtavar, um, you feel like you'd be a great um, election board commissioner and what skills can you bring to the table? Oh, let me, okay, I, I got, what? Oh yeah, oh you have questions or? Okay, go ahead. Also full disclosure, I ran against Bakhtavar as vice president in the 2020 election. Um, <laughs> Hey, um, we are in an organization together. We've had a few classes together. And um, while we're not the best of friends, we are friends nonetheless. So I just wanted to make that clear. Grant. Ditto. <laughs> OK, uh, Leah. I am also in an organization on an exec board with candidate so just letting y'all know that all righty so sorry any any other disclosures before we continue all right i believe you have the floor thank you so just so y'all know a little bit more about me my name is baktavar yasser i am a senior i'm double majoring in political science and criminal justice with a minor in philosophy and a certification in legal studies and i'm here today so I can speak on being your potential new election commissioner. We love the effects. <laughs> so for some of y'all who may not know much about me, here is kind of like my leadership experience. So for the past four years, I have been involved in Alpha Phi Omega National Co-ed Service Fraternity. I have served, I'm served as the secretary, membership vice president, and the sergeant at arms. Um, for Active Minds, I have been the Outreach Coordinator, Secretary, and I'm currently serving as the President, and I am a student representative for the National Active Minds Organization, so I'm a representative, like, nationally. Um, I'm also with an Eagle Thon, which is an organization under the CLS, where we raise money for kids in the Cook's Children's Hospital, and I serve as the Director of Family and Hospital Relations, and I was chosen to um, lead an impact board event, which I was really happy to do so. Um, I'm also a class ambassador, specifically a pre-law ambassador, so I work closely with Dr. Watson. Um, I was also, when IGNI was an organization on campus, I was the public relations chair. Um, I was the VP of social affairs for Green Jackets, and I'm still a member to the semester, and I was on Homecoming Court 2021. So that's just some about my experience. Um, mainly leadership. I have been involved in other orgs as members like NT40, MSA, ASA, and yeah. So the question of why I am best for the position, number one, I do have a neutral point of view. I'm able to separate personal inquiries from professional tasks. For me, it's pretty simple. What's right is right, what's wrong is wrong, and I have no problem just keeping things separate. I think it doesn't get any simpler than that for me. I don't really get peer pressured into anything. I remember when I had my um, interview with Dev and he asked me, how do you handle peer pressure? I just simply like don't get peer pressured for things. So that's not something I'm necessarily concerned or worried about. And number two, I do have experience in constitution bylaws and election information. So I served as the sergeant at arms for my fraternity for about one year. And we did the same things kind of like what David is doing right now, what the election commissioner does, such as running bylaws, constitution, voting. Whenever we had voting for new officers for my fraternity, I was the one who um, managed the elections, managed the voting, so I know who got what votes, and I ran. It was pretty impartial, and yeah. There was just one more, but it was like, if you have any questions, no, it's okay. It was just like, any questions? <laughs> Any motions on the floor? Senator McDowell? I move to a period of questioning. Senator Johnson seconds. All right, you have the first question. Sure, I'm hoping to ask you a couple questions about the election code. So, just to see, you know, if you know about the election code. So, um, I guess my first question would be how much can candidates spend on t shirts?
God, speak in the mic, please. Um, I do not know the answer to that. To be completely transparent, I was holding off on setting the election code, depending on if I got this position. Because if I did, I would study it. I would study it tremendously. I would know it back the back of my hand. But I kind of like held off, to be completely honest. But if I were to get the position, I would make sure that I start studying it tomorrow. Honestly, like I, I mentally plan out like if I were to get it, like I would learn it because I'm the main person responsible. And that holds a lot of power, so don't know it now, but hopefully I will. Well, I guess I don't have any other questions. Then. <laughs> Senator Castellanos. Hello. Uh, my question for you is just what was so appealing about this position to you? Um, I have always wanted to be a part of SGA, but I know I was actually planning on running for Senate or being a part of Senate, but then COVID hit and then like the whole world came to it. And I remember one time I was thinking, I, I was like regretting, I was like, I really wish I was a part of SGA. I'm nearing my senior year at the ending of it. And then I saw a post about it, about how this is a position. And I was like, wait, let me at least see if this is right for me, because I'm not going to apply or run for a position that I think I'm good for, but I'm actually serving and helping people. But I think this is very suited. Um, when I learned about what the election commissioner does, I thought, well, I've done this before. I read in a previous election. I know how it works. And I felt after studying other positions, I think this is the position that will fit me the best. That's So that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Senator Johnson. So obviously, you're beyond qualified for this position. With that in mind, I move that we go to a period of voting. Is there a second? Does anyone object? All right, we're going to go into a period of voting. If you'd like to exit the chamber and um, Senator McDowell will come get you. Okay, Senator Shiloh? Aye. Senator McDowell? No. Senator Allen? Abstain. Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Castellanos? Aye. Senator Gillis? Aye. Senator Guevara? Aye. Aye. Senator Johnson? Aye. Senator McFarland? Aye. Senator Von Boris. Aye. Senator, oh, hold on. Just kidding. Yeah, Senator Taylor. Sorry, I skipped over you. My bad. Aye. Awesome. Okay. Senator M. Aye. Senator Cowell. Aye. Senator Ihermiro Madu. Aye. Aye. Senator Schulte. Aye. And Senator Quibentoro. Aye. Awesome. I believe we do have a two thirds uh, threshold and we have a new election board commissioner. Awesome. Alrighty. I do have a couple announcements regarding. Uh, actually, we have to do Senate appointments. Um, so we can do that quickly at this time. Uh, not Senate appointments for committees. Uh, so I'm going to pull up on the screen. Um, so for Senator um, Taylor and Winston, I'm not going to butcher your last name. Can you please repeat it for me? Okay. He, he, okay. So um, we can open the nomination process. You can also nominate yourself for any of these four committees. But first, let's congratulate our new election board commissioner. Awesome. Now we need to fill the board. So we have person in charge already. So um, we have four committees. Um, we have campus life and environment, diversity and inclusion, internal Senate committee, Legislative, legislative affairs. So, of course, you're required to be on one minimum. You can be 
if you're passionate about all of them, but I'm going to open the floor for any nominations. Senator Johnson, go ahead. I'd like to nominate both uh, appointees or newly confirmed uh, senators to the Campus Life and Environment Committee. Um, is there a second? All right, seconded by Senator Gillis. Winston um, and Anthony, do you accept this nomination? I accept. I accept. Awesome. Any other nominations or interest to be part of a different committee as well? I nominate myself to diversity and inclusion committee. Is there a second? Awesome. Any other nominations? If not, does anyone object um, to Anthony being part of Campus Life and Environment Committee as well as Diversity and Inclusion? Nope. You're now both on the committee. Um, Senator, when is anyone object for Senator Winston to be part of the Campus Life and Environment Committee? Nope. Awesome. You're on that committee. All righty. Um, I'm going to quickly do announcements for committees. Super important, and I know me and the officers discussed this in our officer meeting that we had over the break. Chairs, y'all need to be meeting with your committees. That's something that we, the officer team, our Senate leadership collectively I need you to start meeting more and I need you to send me minutes um, and of course attendance of your meetings to me and Saloni. Something that's really crucial this semester. I want you all to be more involved in committees. I think that's one opportunity that we have that we did not utilize fully last semester. Those committees are there to help you create legislation. You collect information about campus life and environment, um, specifically about pers um, personal, academic, anything that affects the overall quality life of a student of a student that goes to UNT. Um, DNI, things that deals with inclusion or diversity, creating reform that will benefit UNT. The Internal Senate Committee, um, any oversight functions, anything that will relate to the integrity of the Senate, legislative affairs. Anything that you see that needs to be edited or any recommendations that you have, this is the time for y'all to do that. Um, I'll definitely make sure that we're going to have more frequent committee reports and college reports um, because last semester we only had a couple senators in choose legislation. And I think this semester we definitely have a lot of topics that can definitely be covered, but we haven't done that yet. Um, so that's kind of me holding y'all accountable, and I hope that y'all can utilize the committees that we currently have to make things happen and make change. Do we have any questions about that? Awesome. Any announcements? This time is for announcement. Anyone that would like to do announcements, you don't have to be recognized. Um, go ahead, Senator McDowell. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, so... For tabling this semester and for office hours, if you have any questions, uh, the Senate officers, especially me, will take questions on that kind of stuff. Um, executive officers can still sign your hour book or whatever, but we, we can also do that if we're around. Um, and it j just generally, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, also, I was thinking about doing a sort of Senate, as so as, as you probably know, uh, the Commission on SGA Governing Documents is coming to a conclusion on the um, Constitution edits. And so I was thinking about getting a group of senators together j just because uh, I want to speed up the Senate proceedings, like the time we spend in chamber on this. So as much as we can talk about it outside of chambers, I think that'd be helpful. Um, so I'd like to meet with anyone who wants to meet. If you have questions, uh, concerns, um, just so we can try to get that kind of stuff out of the way before, uh, as much of it as we possibly can before Senate, so we're not spending all this time on the floor debating what's 
going to be a huge, huge list of edits. Um, and also, as always, if you have any like questions, comments, concerns, just let me know. All right. Senator Cal, go ahead. Um, if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow at 2 p.m. in here, there's a transportation panel. Yeah. Yeah. See you all there. <laughs> Senator Sophia, go ahead. Um, I was also, can we give a warm welcome to Sophia? She's back from D.C. <laughs> so she's not up there in the screen doing DC stuff, now she's in person. Awesome. All righty. <laughs> um, Bella, go ahead. Come get registered to vote in the SGA office if you aren't registered. You need to be registered by Monday. Um, all of the executive staff are now volunteer deputy registrars so we can register you to vote. Also, College Democrats has the Denton City Council tomorrow at our meeting. Follow us on Insta, Twitter, Facebook. Thanks. All right. Senator M, do you have one? No. Yes, 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 he does. Also, um, shout out to my org. We're having our first meeting on Friday, 5 o'clock, and we'll be doing tea leaf readings where you can like, read your own fortune by drinking tea. So, oh, fortune. Find out. Totally accurate. Tarot cards. All right, Senator Johnson. Uh, mine are more kind of shout outs. Are we doing shout outs or are we doing that? We're still doing shout outs. Uh, yeah. Then I have, well, three, but technically two. One is to our new communications, Colin, doing an absolute whoa, whoa. amazing job. Another is my, I'll, I'll come do three now. Okay, my, another one is my committee. We actually met today. We got a lot done uh, discussing projects and stuff we want to do for the UNT and hopefully maybe partnering with the diversity and inclusion uh, committee. So that's pretty big. So thank you to my committee for coming out today. Thank you. And the minutes, I can't tell you how beautiful they look. Every committee member has access to them now. And another one is, my last one, is to the newly appointed uh, senators for being brave to come before us. Welcome. Welcome to Senate. Thank you. All righty. JT, go ahead. Um, so I have, a, well, one announcement. My first announcement is, of course, uh, BSU has a plethora of events that will be coming out in February for Black History Month. We have over 13 programs, 12 of those programs in conjunction with the MC. So follow a UNT underscore MC and also UNT BSU on Instagram and Twitter and pass it on to your constituents. And I want to give a shout out to two people. Uh, first being Casey. I know he's out right now, but he does so much work behind the scenes that nobody ever sees. Um, and I just really appreciate him. And I want to do more of that this semester because he makes his job so much easier and fun. And it never feels like work because of him. And I really appreciate that. And then secondly, I wanted to shout out to Anthony. Anthony is my resident. I'd have to say that because I'm not insane. I couldn't vote on him. But uh, he was really nervous, but he's really smart, really driven. I'm so excited and glad that he stuck to the goal of trying to join Senate this semester. So congrats to him. Awesome. All right. Casey, go ahead. Yes. So it's wonderful to be back this semester. I look forward to working with everyone. Um, it's really just a... I hope that everyone reaches out, starts collaborating, whether that's between senators, whether that's interns and senators, whether that's senators, interns, executives, ambassadors, whoever that is, because it's going to be a great semester. Um, and, you know, we can work uh, to do great things if, if we work together, um, as well as organizations are in. Make sure you reach out about Eagle's Nest. It's a great opportunity. I know Bella wants to see like 25 more applications next week, but you have to have four weeks ahead of time. So make sure you reach out to organizations so they can go ahead and start planning so they can apply for it. Well, I'm making it rain. Yes, ma'am. All right, Devin, go ahead. Yeah, um, just a couple of uh, reminders, at least for the new senators, we'll need to see um, committee applications for the external committees. Um, I look forward to seeing those and I'll be sure to address them as soon as I can. Um, and Krista, uh, we, I don't know if Krista's still there, but we'll probably need she to discuss. Not. Okay, 
Uh, well, we might need to discuss uh, if there's any rules on informal discussion outside of meetings regarding the constitution updates, but we can get back to you once we have talked to Krista on that a little bit. Um, and then I wanted to shout out the commission. Uh, the commission has been working non pretty much nonstop this last semester, and I know it's not easy work. Um, and I know that I'm an interesting person to work with, I imagine, on the commission. But uh, they do put in a lot of hard work, and they really provide uh, varying perspectives that I believe are are beneficial for um, not only not only the organization but the student body as a whole. And so I wanted to shout them out. Um, I also look forward to working with the interns this year. Um, interns, if they're, I don't know if they're out there or if you're going to be watching this. My man, Justin! <laughs> um, if y'all, if, if y'all are wanting to get stuff done this semester, please work with your senators. Of course, the executive branch is also a resource for you. You know, we want to make sure you feel included in the uh, collaborative process that is the the SGA. Um, but I'm really excited. I'm glad to be back working with you all. Um, it felt kind of weird to be over break and like not having a Senate meeting every Wednesday. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm glad we're back and ready to get started on the on the semester. Sorry, Senate. <laughs> all right, Grant, go ahead. I just have to do one more shout out to Senator Cowell. Uh, for doing uh, 3 a.m. text messages on a piece of legislation we're working on together, just random ideas like, hey, what about this? And she's like, yeah, I like that, or vice versa, just being an awesome senator all hours. Awesome. All right. All right, go ahead, Sophia. I just got back from Washington. Any of y'all would be interested in meeting people that hold your position in government, but actual government, um, NCDC applications are open. There's informal sessions coming up. You can find them on the internet. All of y'all would be more than qualified, and I would love to help. Um, All righty. If there's no other announcements or shout outs, I adjourn this meeting at 7 29 p.m. That's the wrap up for our first meeting. <laughs>